let me let me just say, going on that, yes, certainly Saul and Jim and McLevy and others spent a lot of time in my office, uh, and uh, and that's how I actually got to know Saul. Uh, uh, he had made his discovery. Everybody there knew how important it was, and quite candidly, that it was only a matter of time before the Nobel Prize would be awarded to him. Uh, but he, we were also focused, and he was also focused on, on uh, going much further than that. But, but I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to give you a little introduction. Saul and I actually share some similarities. We grew up in academic families. We were both middle children. You know how hard it is on middle children, so you have to prove yourself. Uh, much deeper than that, we both had Jewish mothers. Uh, he, uh, he grew up in Philadelphia and uh, ended up going to high school, 7th through 12th grade, uh, in a school called Germantown Friends School, which was a Quaker school. Uh, and from that, he followed, you know, in this good Jewish tradition and went to a school founded uh, for the training of Puritan clergy. <laughs> it's called Harvard. Uh, <laughs> um, and from there, and he got his PhD in, in 1981 from Harvard and then went on to Berkeley. At Berkeley, he uh, had a, a really wonderful thesis advisor, a person named Richard Muller, who, uh, a very talented physicist, uh, uh, who gave his students a lot of rope and a freedom to do what they wanted. And, um, and Muller has an, a few famous graduates. Uh, the other, one other is called George, known as George Smooter, uh, who got a Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006. Both Sol and Smoot uh, were graduate students and postdocs and spent their entire careers at LBNL. Um, uh, there's where the similarity ends. I was a graduate student and a postdoc at LBNL also but then uh, I was going to spend my entire career there. That was the game plan. I then became an assistant professor, but I took a leave of absence for um, uh, 19 years. Hmm. <laughs> um, now, I got to tell you a little interesting story about his uh, thesis project. Uh, it, oh, Muller. Now, poor Rich Muller, or you know, his, his thesis advisor was Louis Alvarez, who was one of the really great polymath scientist of all time and a, a real legend in Lawrence Berkeley Lab, also a Nobel laureate, uh, getting his Nobel Prize for a discovery of many, many particles using a bubble chamber, which was invented by another Berkeley Nobel laureate, but never mind that. But, but it turns out Alvarez also, with his son, discovered that what killed the last, the last mass extinction was probably some cataclysmic event, uh, a comet, a meteorite, something, uh, that hit the Earth. Um, and then, but then someone noticed there were many other mass extinctions and they were quasi-periodic and there could be some death star out there, some invisible brown, black dwarf that you couldn't really see and some crazy orbit going back and forth uh, and causing gr great tidal disruptions. And so Sol's uh, thesis project was to find this death star. <laughs> Is that, does it capture it? Yes. <laughs> um, he didn't, but he got good at looking for rare events, <laughs> at which he will tell you about. Um, so, uh, and Louis Alvarez, okay, so poor is Rich Muller, you know, two of his students in Nobel Laureate, his advisor's in Nobel Laureate, the advisor of his advisor in Nobel Laureate, so they just skipped one generation, but everything else was okay. Uh, because Louis Alvarez's uh, mentor was none other than Ernest Lawrence, the inventor of the cyclotron and the founder of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So this is a tradition that goes way back, and it's in this long tradition still going on today where Berkeley Lab uh, has trained as young career scientists, graduates and postdocs in the first job, uh, now over 32 uh, by last count, uh, young scientists went on to get Nobel Prizes. A uh, remarkable tradition. Now, Saul will tell you about a lot of things, but there are two things I want to emphasize before I give him the last five minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, one is that Lawrence founded something called Team Science. He began to put together teams of scientists 
that would work together across many disciplines that, cap, that ta tackle problems that you just simply could not do in an individual small group. And it was that tradition of Lawrence, then amplified by Alvarez, who used to host weekly seminars at his home, at his so-called Group A home, uh, and that has continued at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and, of course, has spread throughout the rest of the world. Uh, and um, uh, so the idea, and, and you'll get this from Saul's talk, and if I encourage you to read what he wrote and that you can click on the Nobel uh, website and uh, what he said at the Nobel banquet speech, which is, uh, you know, you're, you're allowed two or three minutes, and it was a wonderful, wonderful speech. I'm not, so I'm not going to read you those words, but I, I would also like to say, finally, that there's another thing that scientists hope and pray for. You think you, we want to do something to find something to see, see it in measuring something, to do something, but you, what you really want is to measure something where you uh, get the wrong answer. And where, uh, oops, that wasn't what was supposed to happen, and oops, it's better than we thought. And so with that, I'll give you a soul. That's better? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so I'm very glad to be here at, at, at the Department of Energy and because partly I was realizing that so much of the <laughs> sor sorts of work that I think almost all of us do, we never actually get to sort of see the, the, the product um, very often. And, and you know, you, we're not, most of us are not architects and builders and so we can't go back afterwards and say, oh, you know, I built that thing. So I thought that you know, on those rare occasions you know, where there's a, a chance to tell a little bit uh, you know, what kinds of things you know, the work that the Department of Energy does leads to, I, sh I, should, I should take the opportunity to, to do it. And, um, and I also want to do something particularly, you know, practical today with that in mind, which is I was going to see whether it's possible um, in, in, the, in, the, in this one story of, of being able to, um, you know, bec because this is one of these th times where the, uh, you know, the Department of Energy has been able to, you know, do so much to get to the point where we got, an, we were able to win the Nobel Prize, um, it would be great if everybody here would be in a position to go home and explain exactly what it was that the Nobel Prize was, was, uh, was you know, rewarded for. And, uh, and I think what's un rare is to have something, a, such a fundamental physics story, um, be something that you can actually explain to people. So I don't think it's, it's, it's a terribly tall order for me to try to tell you guys what it will take for you to go home and tell your, you know, your families, your, your friends, you know, how it is that we've made this measurement. And, uh, and you'll have to tell me later whether it worked. You can email me and complain you know, which parts didn't. You know. um, but anyway, that's the idea. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll try. And you can start off, I think, uh, the story in, in, in fairly good form because the nice thing is that it begins with a question which I think almost everybody um, you know, could imagine. The very first human beings walking outside at night and I guess out of their caves at night and looking up at the stars and find themselves wondering, you know, does it go on forever in space and will it last forever in time? And it seems almost like what might define uh, what it means to be a human being, that you would find yourself asking that, that kind of question as you looked up at the stars. And throughout almost all of human history and, and prehistory, there was really only one practical way to get an answer to that kind of question, and, and that was to ask the philosophers. And the <laughs> philosophers actually had answers. So you could ask uh, Aristotle, um, do we live in an in infinite or, or a finite universe? And um, he could tell you, he said that we live in a finite universe, and he had a, actually a very interesting argument for um, how we know that we live in a finite universe. He points out that in an infinite universe, there's no place that's special. Every place is equivalent to any other place in an infinite universe. And then he says, you can just go outside and do a very simple experiment. You can look up and you can see that um, there's this beautiful ball of stars, and we're right in the center of the ball of stars. <laughs> and so clearly, the universe has a center, we're there, and, you know, and so the universe must be finite. Um, now, you know, obvi you know, obviously we laugh today, but if you think about it, um, it's a pretty sophisticated <laughs> argument, and we didn't make huge conceptual progress on this for many, many, well, you know, centuries, um, until um, 
actually, you know, one of the moments that really made a huge difference was the beginning of last century when Einstein put down his theory of general relativity, um, which he probably did not do on a billboard. And <laughs> he had a, and, he, uh, and this gave us some more tools to ask this question in a more rigorous way. And he had a very interesting um, moment. I, I, I always uh, pictured in, in, I think it was 1917 in the summer, where he took his theory of general relativity and he tried to apply it to um, the, the case of the universe. And uh, there's a picture of him from 1917. I've always actually imagined him being very excited at that moment, but this doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really show it. Um, so he, ran, he, he quickly ran into a problem, which is that while he, when he worked out his equations, he could, get the, he could get the universe to be sort of contracting in, and he'd get a, a universe that would be expanding out, but he just couldn't get a universe that would sit still. And as far as he knew and as far as you know, his, his astronomy friends knew, uh, the universe was static, and, and so he, he, he did what I think many of us at some point in our you know, high school physics lives have been tempted to do, um, which is to put in a fudge factor into the equations um, to, uh, to make it you know, sort of just balance out. And now when Einstein does it, it, it looks good. He calls it the cosmological constant, and he uses the Greek variable lambda. And, um, but it really wasn't actually that great a solution. It kind of made a universe that would just kind of teeter on balancing uh, and standing still. Um, and it was only within you know, a dozen years that uh, Slipher and, and, and Hubble um, uh, realized, uh, made measurements, and, they, and we then realized that the universe really was expanding. And, uh, and famously, um, Einstein called this his greatest blunder. Um, I've, been, I've been joking with my friends and, and you know, saying that he, you know, he, had a, he had a chance. He could have predicted that the universe was expanding. He could have been famous. You know, <laughs> but <laughs> he, di he didn't. <laughs> so, so what was it that... Um, that uh, that Hubble was seeing um, uh, that made him th b believe that we have an expanding universe. Well, he was looking at these very faint, uh, sort of fuzzy regions in, in, the, in the distant sky. At the time, they called them nebula. We now know that they were distant galaxies. And he was uh, measuring the, uh, their brightness and also um, their, their spectral features, these little lines in, in the spectrum. And uh, what he found was that the ones that were further away, which, well, ones that were fainter, which he assumed were the ones that were further away, um, had their lines shifted further and further to the red, which um, he assumed was a Doppler shift, you know, just the same way a car horn sounds higher pitched as it comes towards you and the lower pitch as it goes away from you. Similarly, if these galaxies are moving away from us, the lines get shifted towards the red in the, in the spectrum uh, in, in of light as well. And so this was, was the evidence that we had an expanding universe. Now, at this point, when you're trying to explain this, you know, to your friends and family at home, um, I hope that somebody stops you because the whole idea of an expanding universe is one that you really should stop at. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think, you know, one of the more mind-boggling ideas. Now, when you talk about cosmology, you're, you're in for mind-boggling ideas no matter what. I mean, just, just the ideas of these distances and you know, the idea that the universe you know, could go on forever, and these things are just mind-boggling. But a expanding universe should really bother you. It should be particularly mind-boggling. And, and the reason is uh, because most people, when you hear the word expanding universe, especially when you've heard the terms Big Bang, um, it makes you think of an explosion. It makes you think of stuff exploding into space. And then you find yourself thinking, yeah, but isn't that space part of the universe? And you know, what's expanding then if that space is part of the universe too? So um, I've been trying to come up with a, a different way of, of uh, describing it. I think that's actually a, a very poor representation, a very poor way to be thinking when you, of, of the expanding universe. Um, even though all the popular, you know, popular science writers tend to fall into that trap, I think, of describing as if it were an explosion. Um, so I've been trying out a slightly different uh, picture of the universe. So let me show you uh, my, my conception of it. It's a somewhat simplified um, picture because um, I, I can't draw very well. You're supposed to imagine that these are all, th these are all galaxies. And if I were able to draw better, I would have been able to draw them going infinitely off you know, that direction and infinitely off in this direction. And infinitely into the screen and infinitely out towards you. And you're supposed to imagine it really is an infinite universe. The galaxies go on forever and ever and ever in all directions, never stops. And that's supposed to be the picture of the universe today that you have in your mind. Um, and the only thing that's, uh, that you should you know, capture about this, this picture of the universe is that there's sort of a typical distance, typical average distance between the galaxies. Of course, in the real world, you know, some are a little bit closer to each other, some are a little bit further, but on average, um, they're, they're you know, a certain distance apart, um, and it takes a you know, certain amount of you know, travel time to get from one to the next. Now, when I say the universe is expanding, all I mean is that we've pumped a little bit more space between all those distances, and so all the galaxies are now just a little bit further apart. 
And that's all I mean by an expanding universe. Just still infinite, as far as we know, goes on forever in all directions, maybe all the same galaxies, just that there's a little bit more space between them. It takes a little bit more time to get from one galaxy to the next. And that's um, what you're supposed to picture when you say an expanding universe. So now there's nothing that anything's expanding into. It's still infinite. It's just that we're sort of pumping space in between the galaxies. If you go back in time, in fact, you start sucking the space out between the galaxies, things get closer and closer together. Eventually, you go far enough back in time and everything's on top of each other. And that's really, I think, what we sh should have been describing as the Big Bang. Um, but I, I, you know, in some sense, we should have called it the Big Soup. You know, just everything is sort of on top of each other. It could still be infinite uh, you know, in, in this picture, up to the point where we don't know how to do the calculations anymore, when things get so dense that our, and, and hot that our, our physics uh, theories you know, need, need you know, a little more than, than what we currently have. So um, that's the picture of an expanding universe that I think is helpful to have in your mind. It's a very you know, simplified picture, but with that picture, I think you can now go back and ask that question about the fate of the universe in a slightly more rigorous way. Because now, when you hear about the universe expanding, you can start finding yourself asking, OK, but if it's, if it's expanding, is it going to keep doing it the same way? Is it going to expand at the same rate? And in fact, you might <coughs> expect that all these galaxies, um, you know, they all have mass. They might gravitationally attract each other. So maybe that could slow the expansion down. And, uh, and if it's slowing, could, it, could there be enough stuff in the universe that it would actually slow someday to a halt and maybe collapse? Um, so then you have a, a, a completely different way of asking about um, what is the fate of the universe, because you can go back and look back in time and ask, well, what, what's it doing before? Has the universe been slowing down in the past? And it turns out that we have ways of asking that question, um, and that's a, a measurable thing, which uh, you know, we don't have to go to Aristotle for, for this. So let me, uh, let me um, sh uh, t describe you know, how we do that. First, we, we have a, conveniently enough, the universe has provided us a tool um, to, to make that measurement, and that is in the form of an of exploding star um, a supernova, when that and a supernova is a very bright um, explosion because when w that one star um, explodes in a galaxy of you know maybe a hundred billion stars, that one star can be brighter than all the other stars um, put together in that in that one galaxy. So that's you know remarkably bright. So you can see them across vast distances across the universe, and when you can see things at vast distances across the universe, you um, actually get to see back in time because it takes time for that light to travel to us all those vast across those vast distances. So here's the part where now, when you're explaining this to your family and friends, um, you might have to explain to them um, what, you know, how you should think about um, how much time it takes for light to travel across the distances in the universe. I think most people are, are you know, aware of the fact that light takes time to travel. Um, you know, that point, I think, you'll get across fairly quickly when you say it, um, you know, when you tell it to somebody. But I think most people are not aware of how long it takes for light to travel across the distances um, that exist in, in, the, in the universe that we get, to, we get to observe. So let me just walk through a few of these distances. First, um, the sun. The, uh, if you ask you know, how long does light take to reach us from the sun, it's only about eight minutes. So you know, someday, if the sun were to go out, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes. Now, we might notice it. You know, then, the nearest star um, is, is, uh, is you know, the travel time is four years. So, you know, we've orbited the, uh, the sun four times in the, in the since the light left that star that you would get to see um, that's you know, relatively, relatively near. So that's okay, but it gets more interesting now as you get to the nearest galaxy of stars. Now you're looking at light, this light that we see in that galaxy left that, um, th those uh, stars there some 150,000 years ago. So the light left there around the time when here on Earth we have some of the first evidence for human culture. Um, that's my attempt at drawing human culture. I'm not <laughs> very good. They, but now it gets even more interesting as you look at the, the closest congregations of galaxies of stars. So that's the nearest um, galaxy cluster. Now you're looking at light that left those stars some 65 million years ago. That's when here on <coughs> Earth the, the dinosaurs are going extinct. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my extinct dinosaur. So, <laughs> but that's nothing compared to the, I mean, these, these supernovae are so bright that that's nothing compared to um, how uh, far back in time this uh, supernova explosion um, occurred that we get to see today which is, uh, you can the furthest we can see is, that is 10 billion years ago. So that's almost two-thirds of the way, that's more than two-thirds of the way back to what we think was the, be the, the beginning of what we've studied, the, you know, the Big Bang or, or Big Soup, as I call it. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, if you think about it, it's incredible that this star exploded some 10 billion years ago, and it, you know, it brightened in just a few weeks, it faded away in, 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 in just a few months, and that pulse of light's been traveling to us to tell us you know, that little bit of history from 10 billion years ago 
Oh, and over all that time, eventually, the, you know, the sun formed and the solar system formed and, you know, and uh, life evolved on Earth and, you know, and it evolved up to, to humans and we got to learn how to build telescopes. And we built a telescope just big enough, just in time, to, and pointed in right the right direction and it, you know, the, it fell into our telescope. I mean, so it's, it's just remarkable to see that we were able to study just a bit of history now from something that far back in, back in time. Um, all right, so, uh, I, oh, and, and, I, and I particularly like um, this particular animation that gives you a sense of how, how vast these distances are. So it begins with an artist's uh, rendition of a, of a supernova exploding in a distant galaxy, but then it morphs onto real data, first from the Hubble Space Telescope and then from other telescopes. And you get a sense um, for you know, how remarkably distant um, the, these events are. I mean, just, just very, <laughs> very, 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 <laughs> just extremely. <laughs> Anyway, just it's it's so far away, and and here at the end that shows you where this will be in the night sky. Uh, yeah, that you just I mean it's it's just remarkable, you know, how, how how vast these these distances are that we and that we get now to see. All right, so um, now you need to explain that with these vast distances, um, that you are going to need to um, use these supernova as what we call a standard candle, where the brightness of the supernova will tell you um, how far away it is. So the you know as you walk away with your candle. The further you get, the, faint, the fainter it is. So that's a fairly straightforward concept. But somebody might ask, why is it that the supernova are all the same brightness? Um, and there, um, <laughs> you have to say that um, all supernova are the, you know, aren't the same brightness, but there's one kind, which we call the type 1a, that we recognize by its spectrum, um, where when they explode, we think what's going on is that um, there is a, a, a dying ember of a star. This will be after our sun uses up all of its fuel. It'll be left uh, dying off as a white dwarf. Um, not bothering anybody, um, unless it happened to have a neighboring star orbiting around it nearby, and ours doesn't. Um, uh, but most stars in the sky do have some neighbor, and many of them have a neighbor that's reasonably nearby, and it can slowly dump mass from this other star onto this white dwarf over you know, uh, ages and ages until just enough mass falls on the star that you have a critical mass. And then you get a runaway thermonuclear explosion, and so that's the reason we think that these are triggered phenomenon and that they are actually at the same brightness each time. So now you can use these in that way as a standard candle, and you can tell how far away it is just by how bright it is. Now, there's one other piece of information that you need um, to, get a to, to know here, which is that when the supernova explodes, um, it sends most of its light in the blue um, wavelength, so it's very short wavelength. So if you were you know, looking at one close up and, and you didn't die, um, it, would look, it would look mostly blue. Um, but <laughs> the supernova, um, the light then travels to us you know, as the universe um, stretches, and <laughs> In a, in a universe that's expanding, anything that's not nailed down in the universe stretches just with the universe, and that includes this very wavelength of light. So by the time it reaches us, um, it's been stretched to, to looking red, and uh, how red it looks um, tells you how far away, I'm sorry, tells you um, how much the universe has stretched in the, in, the, in the time since the explosion of that supernova. Now, we call this redshift, and in fact, in the cosmological story, it really is due to the stretching of the universe. Um, generally, most of it is not due to that Doppler shift that Hubble was, was talking about um, that I mentioned at the beginning. So in some sense, it's this amazing trick. It's, it's, it's a very direct measurement of how much the universe has stretched since the time when that one supernova exploded. And, uh, and so you can imagine you know, that a supernova in the distant galaxy explodes, and then as the light travels to us, beginning blue, and the universe keeps stretching, the wavelength stretches until by the time it reaches us, it looks red. And, and uh, that's just how you read off the stretch of the universe since that time. So that's the entire story, and I think you can go home now and tell that to your <laughs> <laughs> Well, almost the entire story, because <coughs> if you think about it, this tells you how much the universe has stretched since one time in history. Um, the time when that one supernova exploded, which of course you know because you know how bright the supernova is and how faint it is tells you how far back in time that was. Um, but what you really want to do is find a series of supernova at of different brightnesses, representing different times back in history. So you find a fairly bright one, maybe that's from about a you know, billion years uh, back in time, and it tells you how much the universe has stretched since a billion years ago. Then you find another one from maybe four billion years back in time, and it tells you how much the universe has stretched since four billion years ago, and then another one from seven. And you just keep doing this, and then plotting the points, and you see whether or not the universe was slowing down enough to come to a halt. And that's, and that's really the measurement. And for a little while, I always thought, I thought this was such a simple story that I could actually tell you uh, this talk um, in the form of you know, how to measure the fate of the universe with tools you can find in your own house. 
And so it almost works. The idea is that um, you only need, nowadays, uh, you, you, just, you just need a CCD detector. And nowadays, almost everybody has a CCD camera uh, detectors in the back of their, um, of their camcorders and their digital cameras. Um, and, you know, and that's good enough. Uh, now, when we began the project, they were, they, you know, that wasn't the case. But um, now, you, know, you all have those. Um, you read out that, uh, that digital image into your laptop computer. Nowadays, your laptop computers are fast enough to do all this image analysis that for us was you know, heroics you know, back when we were beginning uh, the, you know, the project uh, using all the computers we could. Um, and, uh, but you know, your laptop's good enough, so you just connect your CCD to your laptop, and you go out and you put it onto your, uh, you go out and, and put it onto your telescope. And, <laughs> and of course, <laughs> that, that's where this idea didn't work, because <laughs> the problem is, obviously, you need the biggest telescopes on Earth. Um, to measure these very, very faint supernova explosions. And so um, <laughs> this is where uh, the idea actually was a problem for us when we began the project, because these big telescopes, um, you have to apply to use them six months in advance. And you have to, uh, and if you're lucky, you get one or two nights of telescope time to, to use that telescope. And, uh, it, you know, it, th and, I, and I was telling you before about how good the, the uh, supernova is, you know, how wonderful it was for, for this work. Um, I have to it, tell you now that if you can use anything else for your research, you should use it. They're a pain in the neck <laughs> to work with. The Type 1a supernova, they, you know, th they're rare. They only explode a couple times per millennium in a given galaxy. And you know, it's only so long you want your grad students to have to hang around. The, <laughs> they don't give you any advance warning you know, when they're going to explode. So you, you, you have no idea when, when it's going to happen. And uh, they fade away. You, know, you have to catch them on the way up, of course, because you know how bright they are at peak. And that's what you have to calibrate off of. And so you need to catch them while they're still rising in just a couple of weeks. So it made a you know, terrible telescope proposal to say, you know, I'd like the night of you know, March the 3rd, because sometime in the next 500 years, a supernova might go off. And, <laughs> and so in the beginning, a lot of, the, uh, of it, uh, the effort had to be turning this into a much more organized way of doing the science. Um, and so uh, what we ended up doing is developing these wide field cameras that could not allow us to, would allow us to not just search one galaxy at a time for 500 years, but to search through thousands of galaxies in a night. And, uh, and then you would have a, um, good odds of having, well, you know, excellent odds of having half a dozen to a dozen supernova on that night um, discovered. And, um, and in particular, uh, in, you know, this telescope, if you take a time lapse exposure for 10 minutes, um, gives you an image, gives you this image. And uh, what you want to look at is not these distracting, beautiful looking things in the front, but you want to look at these uh, very faint little specks, these little blue specks all over the place here. Those are all the distant galaxies, about four billion years in this particular <laughs> case, uh, that you're seeing back in time. And those are the places where you want to look for the supernova. Um, in fact, you were trying to find a little speck of light on one of these little blue specks um, that is a supernova explosion. And of course, that was the other hard part of the project at the beginning. You had to develop the image analysis software that would allow you to hunt through all of these little faint blue specks and find a, another tiny speck, which is your dramatic supernova explosion, um, if, you if you could find it. So you got to the point that the uh, computer could home in on this little region right here and tell you that this spot here was fainter three weeks before, and now it's brighter. And if you subtract this image from this image, you're left with just the supernova light. And so now you could start to uh, guarantee supernova discoveries. We even figured out a way of timing this whole thing such that you could even say that you'd always find it just before new moon. Um, so you could schedule the dark time of the, of the month, which you need to use these uh, very uh, big telescopes to uh, look for something so faint. We even were able to start saying what degree in the sky we would find that um, supernova on in that particular date. Um, and that was important because if we want to use the Hubble Space Telescope, as we then started to do, um, they need to know uh, not where to slew the telescope over in advance. And of course, we know what degree in the sky we would find the supernova in because that was the degree in which we looked. Um, so that was you know, fairly uh, doable. But there you can see the white spot is the supernova and the background smudge is the galaxy. On the ground, they all get blurred together. So this um, technique started to work. We started churning out a, a batch of supernova discoveries every um, time we went to the telescope. So we would do this every semester. You apply in these six-month chunks. And uh, over the course of, of, of a few years now, um, we now had, had built up a sample of some 42 supernova. And that seemed like a very auspicious number to us for, for those people who, uh, re <laughs> who, who know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's, I'll explain later. Um, so uh, we, we're now finally ready um, to get the answer to, the, to this problem um, of what is the fate of the universe. And uh, you, know, you can make the plot that I was describing to you, you know, using your supernova um, in the form of what's the you know, sort of average distance between galaxies as a function of time. And, uh, <laughs> and possibility number one 
was that we always did, we thought the universe would be slowing because all the gravity of the stuff in the universe would slow it down. We just didn't know how much. And so one possibility would be that it would be slowing and slowing, but it would keep going forever and keep slowing down. And uh, just to give you a more visceral feel for what that, that, would, you know, that looks like, um, I made this little animation. You used to imagine that you're lying on your back looking up at the sky, and I guess you have telescopes for eyes, and it looks a little bit like this. Everything is expanding away from each other and away from you, and they're expanding but getting slower and slower and slower, but this keeps going um, on forever. So that was one option. Option two um, is a little bit more dramatic. There you imagine that the universe um, has enough stuff in it to slow to a halt and then turn over and collapse. And then and that uh, universe does have an end. We, call it th we could call it the Big Crunch. Um, in, in that version, you know, to, uh, to complement the Big Bang. So, um, th th you know, this one is fun to look at. You know, you everything expands away from each, uh, from each other, and then it slows down, and eventually comes to a halt, and then starts turning around and coming back in, I guess, at you. <laughs> you start getting a little nervous. <laughs> and this universe really does, you know, have an end. <laughs> so, so we thought this was going to be fun. I mean, because you, you were, <coughs> we had the data, we were going to get to see you know, which of these two lines we, we live on, and we figured whichever answer we got, it was going to be pretty dramatic. You know, one case, you get this fiery ending. The other case, um, the universe actually is really infinite, and we've proven that the universe is infinite then. And we, and we thought it was going to be great, and of course, what we found when we plotted the data points on this graph is the answer turned out to be, <laughs> you know, none of the above. It was, um, the universe is just taking off. It, you know, it, it's expanding now, and it's, but it's going to expand faster and faster, and then whoosh, you know, you know pretty soon you're not going to be able to see any other galaxies. I've been arguing actually for funding agencies that this is our moment to do astronomy. You know, this is our big <laughs> chance to. You know, only a few billion years left, you know, and then. <laughs> so, so this was the result um, that you, that you that you've heard about, and that's you know, and that was such a surprise. And wh what it means apparently is that we. Um, oh, and let me show you. Uh, and let me just show you what the data really looks like on, on uh, with real data points um, on a, on the same plot. So the average distance between the galaxies as a function of time. Here's today. You're, we have nearby supernova that don't tell you, you know, which line we live on, uh, but, they, uh, but they do show you that the relative brightness of the supernova tells you how far away they are and thus how far back in time you're looking. And then the redshift, um, the stretch of the uh, wavelength, tells you how much the universe has stretched since uh, that, that time. So that's why you can plot these points on the graph. And then when we plotted all the, the points that, we've, uh, that we uh, got these higher redshifts to see which of these lines we live on, whether it'll go on forever or turn over and collapse, we found that the data points missed all the lines, of course, and, uh, and apparently we live in a universe that was decelerating way back in the past, but in the last half of its life it's been accelerating. And, uh, and so that's what the real data looked like um, at, at the time. And, uh, and there's, uh, there are two groups that were doing this, so that was the other thing that made a very big difference at this point, um, that uh, the th another group started using our technique to find these and, and study these supernova, and, um, and so interestingly enough, they're the person who was analyzing their data at that time, at Adam uh, Reese, was, up, was down the hill from where I was uh, <laughs> at Berkeley, um, ar just around the same time analyzing the data, calling the head of their group in Australia. Um, and, uh, and so we were all you know, independently seeing the surprise. We did not know, you know people were hiding the, uh, the information from each other, of course, until we were ready to, to go public. Um, and of course, there's the whole teams of people um, who were having the surprise together. From this is a one of the rare pictures of the two teams uh, uh, together. Um, and um, I, at this point, I always wanted to stop and, and, and remind people that um, although this is a popular image of science as being done you know, by the lone scientists going off to the lab by themselves, it's really nothing like my experience of science at all. And uh, you know, almost all the science that you know that I've been done, I've done is in really close coordination with these amazing teams of people. Um, all working, you know, nonstop together, and and uh, and I sometimes say that you know if you want to um, if you want to do something social in your life, you should go into science. It's the most social activity that I know about, and I think people aren't aware of that. So I, you know, I've been explaining that to uh, you know when I go to speak at universities that you know if, if you really want to spend time with others, you know that's that you know that's the the, uh, the job you should you should you should find yourself doing. Um, okay, so. Um, apparently, we have a very surprising um, outcome of all this. Why is it the universe is uh, expanding faster? We don't know. Um, one possibility, and, uh, and what we've been using as our placeholder for the moment, is this term called dark energy, which is that all of empty space could be pervaded by an energy that's, uh, that causes the universe to reproduce faster and faster between the galaxies. You know, it's getting uh, ex expanding. Uh, at accelerating rate, um, and this energy would be something that we have not accounted for previously in our in our physics, and yet it could be almost three quarters of the stuff of the universe. Now that's the uh, that'd be remarkable, and of course 
maybe even more remarkable would be if it turned out that um, we I that that wasn't the answer. Maybe we actually need to modify Einstein's theory of general relativity, and it'll be we'll have to actually uh, go back to something so fundamental and and uh, and you know change our basic conceptions of, of physics. So um, you know wh whichever is the case, it's going to be uh, you know remarkable. Um, th it's obviously triggered a torrent of papers from the uh, from the theorists. And I, I was looking back in the, uh, in, on the archive the other day, and, and I realized that it's been averaging a, a little bit more than one paper per day for the past 12 years since the discovery um, from the theoretical community um, on this. And if you, uh, oh, and, they, and they come up with great names for these theories. I love, you know, like the phantom energy and big rip cosmology, and I can barely pronounce ekperotic the universe. And <laughs> but it's I think it's fair to say if you ask any of these theorists, um, do you stand behind your theory, um, and they will... Um, cheerfully admit to you, no, 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 um, you know, I'm just trying to expand the range of possibilities. Um, you know, I have no idea whether this is going to turn out to be the right answer or not. Um, and they really say, they really put the question back to us, the observers and the experimentalists, and they say the ball is back in our court. Um, we really need to give them a little more of a, of a pointer as to you know, what direction to, to pursue and, uh, and, and what, what is the most likely range of possible um, theories uh, that might, might explain what's going on. And, um, and so, so uh, we've not been sitting around. It's actually been a, <laughs> a very, it's been a pretty productive, productive period despite this quote. Um, and, and, and let me just show you s some of what's, what's happened. Um, first, you know, the, this plot with the data points from the two groups, the, between the 42 that we had and the other group's data, there was a little bit over 50 supernova um, at the time when, we've, when we first got this result. Now, um, if I, let's see, turn this plot around and flip it upside down and uh, put it the way that the astronomers like to, to show it, um, the data sets um, have, have built up dramatically. Now there's almost, there's more than 10 times as many, um, uh, more than 500 supernova on the plot. And e almost every one of those 500 supernova has a b is better measured than almost any of those first 50 that we uh, made that, that original measurement with. So there's been tremendous progress in improving this, uh, these data sets. This is from a compilation that we just put together this past, this past year from all these different uh, groups, including many, pro many of these uh, projects that we've been involved with as well. Um, but it's also true that um, almost all of those, what did I show you, about 5,000 papers um, of theories uh, that might explain dark energy, um, still any of those would be satisfied with this data set. Um, they don't, this doesn't distinguish yet. And the problem is, um, that you, you really um, need to make a, a, a very detailed measurement. Um, in particular, if you, uh, you know, at the time when we gained this result, we had to distinguish which of these lines we lived on. Um, now, the data set looks tremendous. It's obvious which line we live on, although it gets a little ratty as you get up to these um, higher, uh, you know, further back in time. Um, but uh, now, all those theories of dark energy um, that you have to distinguish are within the thickness of this green line. So we need something like 20 times more precision um, than we originally needed um, in order to be able to make this next step forward. Um, now, I won't have time to go into um, how we're going to do that, but I will say that we, um, that we've made, uh, that we now know what it's going to take to make the, these steps. We've gone through each of the places in which error comes in, and I think when you start trying to tell the story, as I'm sure everybody will when you go home, uh, um, you'll find that because um, it's such a simple story, people immediately start thinking of the obvious objections, what could go wrong. And they will think of some of these that I will show you. For example, how do we know the supernova, um, when they explode back, way back in time, are the same as the supernova um, that we see today? How do we know that they, the light isn't dimmed by going through dust, uh, you know, just like the, uh, you know, this, the light from the sun uh, you know, gets red as it goes you know, the atmosphere? It's obviously, it's getting dimmed. Um, how do, you know, they, they probably won't think of gravitational lensing. That's where the uh, uh, light gets slightly uh, amplified um, by um, being bent around intervening matter between us and the distant supernova. Um, there's problems of the atmosphere that we're looking through. There are problems of the, of the actual instrumentation, the telescopes, the filters, the detector response, <coughs> if you don't get them perfectly calibrated. And all these things can contribute um, to, the, to this whole story of, of you know, getting this precision improved by 20. But we actually have now done a um, remarkable amount of work uh, where we think we've identified what it takes to make each of these steps um, do the job if we have the right instrumentation. Um, and in fact, some of the work uh, that I won't be discussing ha um, goes back to reanalyzing the low redshift end, uh, you know, the very nearby um, supernova at, that are you know, reasonably recent. Um, and so there's a project that we've been working on called Nearby Supernova Factory, 
um, which has been very, uh, you know, very, very busy answering these sorts of questions. Um, but I think it's fair to say that if we if we are able to build this next generation of, of projects, we are going to be able to take the um, the measurements from nearby supernova and extend them all the way out um, with this factor of 20 times improvement. Uh, and, and so I, I think we're in very um, good shape for that next step in that direction. But it's not just supernova. We've actually, in this last 12 years, um, had, uh, as a community, been uh, developing a few other techniques now as well. And uh, I, the each of them is another you know, short uh, um, uh, you know, lecture uh, where you can tell your friends about it, but I won't do it today. Um, one of them has to do with moving forward in time from the, uh, the, uh, the hot and cold spots of the Big Bang that we see in the cosmic microwave background, and it overlaps the supernova, so we get um, two cuts at, at that curve. Another technique is o uh, almost orthogonal to these, conceptually, um, where you're actually looking at that bending of light that I was mentioning due to matter between us and distant galaxies. And, uh, and this technique has an advantage um, that when you use it together with the supernova and Bowering acoustic oscillation, it can separate out um, possible changes in Einstein's theory of general relativity, so we can see which turns out to be the best answer. Is it a change in our theory of gravity or is it um, this, uh, you know, this mysterious dark energy um, that pervades empty space? And so we, we, are, we have a lot of the conceptual tools now to approach this next problem. And it's been taken uh, to the point that we have actual engineering diagrams for real projects um, which have now gone through all the prioritization processes and we're looking forward to them actually moving ahead in a, in, you know, with real metal and, and, uh, and glass you know, and, and, and seeing the, uh, the things built. Um, these are all the acronyms that, that show up for you know, uh, weak lensing techniques, for barren acoustic oscillation techniques. These are satellite um, options that we've, uh, that we've developed. And, uh, and I think that when I look at these names, one thing that comes to mind um, in this context, just to get back to where we were at the beginning, is that it's interesting to note that almost every one of these experiments um, came out actually of, was, uh, uh, most, uh, most of the formative work um, came out of work that was done within DOE um, Dewey Labs and, and, and uh, University uh, Research. So it really is a very interesting DOE product. And, 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 I, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to finish for a moment just describing why it is, I think, that this DOE, the DOE approach to supporting science um, has been so successful. And why is it that there have been two Nobel Prizes now in the past five years um, in, in coming out of this kin kind of a uh, you know, stimulated work from, uh, work stimulated by DOE. Um, and I think there are a number of aspects of, of what, we what we do um, at, at DOE in, in, a, in a DOE environment that's a little bit different um, than most funding models. And, uh, and, I, and I want to call them out. I mean, one of them, uh, one aspect is the fact that there's a, there's a willingness to take on large projects. And, I, and large in a number of different ways. Um, sometimes it's just it's large in number of people that's involved. Sometimes it's physically large. You actually have to build large pieces of equipment. Um, and, and it's a certain can-do spirit. It's also large sometimes in, t in the time scales of exploration that it's going to take. So people often describe um, uh, you know, projects in terms of these you know, short time horizons of when you have to write a proposal and when you're going to you know, get, your, get your results. When we began this project that I'm describing to you today, we thought it was going to be a very hard project. We thought it would take us three years to get the answer. Now, three years in, we just sort of figured out how to do the project. And the answer didn't come until 10 years in. And I don't think anybody was disappointed um, at the end that it took us 10 years to get this answer. I think that's well worth 10 years. But, but science funding is rarely, um, it has that breathing space and that sense of purpose where you're going to keep working until you get the result when it's important to do. And so I think that's one aspect that DOE um, has been particularly good at. Another one um, is bringing together uh, many different capabilities. So when, I, when we needed to build our first wide-field camera, um, first of all, the, you know, the theorists who would, it, who would give us the ideas of what we need to measure were down the hallway. The, the uh, opticians, the, the electrical engineers, the mechanical engineers, everybody was all around. The expertise for how you build an experiment um, was right there. And we were able to put these together in ways that I think were difficult to do in, in any other environment. And so I think this is something else that these national labs um, allow. And, uh, and in coordination with the universities, it's, it's sort of an amazingly powerful uh, you know, a approach. Now, you know, all that only works, of course, if you have people you know, who know what they're doing with these, with these uh, resources. And we've been, I think, very fortunate that DOE, from the top down 
to you know, the, the people who are on the ground you know, trying to get things done have been able to help make these things occur. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm very aware, for example, right now that our, you know, our program manager, Kathy Turner, is somebody who is fighting ever since we were getting these results for you know, giving us the flexibility in the room to make these next steps possible. And it's, you know, and it's been clear that there's been one person after another who, in the course of the project I was describing, um, said, you know, I know that they don't have a result today, and I know that's not obvious what this result, I how it's going to fit into everything else we're doing, but this is important, and they kept that breathing space for the science to occur. And I think that's something that's just, uh, that's important and unusual, and, you know, it has to be uh, recognized. Um, then, all that happens, I think, also, if you have a real, a real sharp sense of mission um, in, in, the, in the science. You know, what is exciting science to do? And it, right in the heart of the DOE mission, and you, know, you get these mission statements like, uh, you know, understanding how our universe works at the most fundamental level, um, and exploring the basic nature of space and time itself, and probing interactions between them. You know, this is the kind of question that gets really smart people really interested. And at, you know, doing all parts of the task, um, they get engaged by these kinds of problems and they create things that you otherwise don't create. Um, and I think that that sense of, a, of, of going for a goal, making and doing an experiment, is something that DOE has really um, excelled, excelled in. Um, it also uh, m you know, meant that we, you know, in, in this particular area, that we're able to pull together questions that come from all parts of this, these very fundamental areas. And the, what we call the, uh, the energy frontier, the cosmic frontier, the intensity frontier, these are different um, parts of the fundamental physics program of particle physics. And what's interesting to note today is that so many of our most fundamental questions are being brought over from the cosmic frontier, um, the questions that are the biggest mysteries today in, in particle physics. Uh, most of them are coming now from, you know, brought in from the cosmic frontier into these other areas. Um, and of course, we, you know, they bounce back and forth as to which is asking the questions any given, you know, decade. But it is interesting that right now we're in a very unusual period where these questions are so much driven um, by, the, by the cosmic frontier um, in these most fundamental directions. So let me stop um, here with just, uh, just one sort of, one or two uh, philosophical comments about uh, what to me feels like a, a, um, an amazing bit of magic about the world. Um, you know, w one is the fact that when you're doing these very fundamental questions, um, it, it's, it's just remarkable to me that it over and over again, when you've learned something very, very fundamental about the deepest underpinnings of how the world works that seems completely impractical, that somehow has ended up translating into um, something that allows us to do more in, in our world around us. And it's been the, I think it's been the, the the driver of so much of the uh, most important developments of our, of, of our, the world around us and our economies um, today. And so it, there's this very, you know, impossible to explain way in which when you do these deep fundamental questions, you're actually building the next generation of, of, uh, of you know, technology and, and economies that, that we live in. So uh, it's always worth repeating that just because it's, it's so hard to believe. But it's but it, it it always has happened. Every time we've we've learned something about how the world works, we've learned more how to use the world that, that we live in. And then there's also this other magical element that I just have to bring up here as well, which is that um, surprisingly enough, you know, our brains, you know, that evolved in the world, that, you know, that seems so tangible that we that we w walk through, seem to be able to understand this stuff, and <laughs> that somehow, as every time we've been able to get a whole new data set, you know, learn a new way of looking at things in a young field <laughs> like, like cosmology still is, we've ended up um, being able to discover something new and fundamental about the world. And once more, I don't know how long that's going to keep going, uh, that we're going to be able to keep up with what we, what we see when we make a measurement. But somehow, every time we've made these big steps forward in measurements, we've learned something amazing about how the world works. Um, and so I, I'll just leave you, uh, you know, with, with this thought that we're at this very early stage in cosmology where every data set that we've come up with has taught us something new. We've just seen this, that's th this data set told us that the universe is accelerating. Just a huge surprise. And I think we're now about to go through the next, I'm hoping, we'll build these next generation of instruments and we'll get this next discoveries. And uh, I'm really looking forward to coming back and uh, you know, maybe being participating in the, in the next ones or sitting in the audience and hearing the next you know, DOE-led uh, you know, uh, um, Nobel Prize uh, from, from these, these fields. So let me, let me stop there and, and see if there, there are questions.
can see, okay, there's some a hand back there. I'm not sure how to ask this question, but how does this work that you've described uh, illuminate <laughs> or fit in with this ideas about multiverses? Okay. Yes. So uh, among the, those uh, what uh, 5,000 uh, um, theory uh, papers, um, there's been a whole series that, has to, uh, that comes out of this area called string theory, um, where they've been trying out some ideas um, where they ask, is it possible that what we're seeing here um, is a reflection of, the, of a broad range of possible universes that you could have, and then you statistically study what's the most probable kind of universe, and you say that if you can come up with a theory where the most probable kind of universe has these properties, then that counts as an explanation um, for, for what we see. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a bit of a stretch in, 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 in thinking, of course, to imagine all these universes that have nothing to do with each other, and the only reason we know they're there is because we see one of the uh, results of the statistics of, of you know, what's the most typical kind of universe. Um, I, I, at, at the moment, I, I would still say that uh, probably most physicists are, 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 have are probably doubting whether string theory in its current form is going to be the answer, but um, it's perfectly possible. If we ever build the James Webb Telescope on the NASA side, how does that fit in with your work? So the um, Webb Telescope, the JWST as it's called, um, a, is a much larger telescope in space, and it will make it possible for us to make some of those the very detailed measurements of these quite distant supernovae, the ones that are um, back, you know, on those plots I was showing you, that are so far back that the data was getting rather ratty, as I, as I mentioned. And those will help us recognize that those very, very distant ones, um, uh, which ones of the very distant ones are the same kind of supernova as the, as the uh, matching ones that we see today, so you can make that distance measurement. So that will, um, that, that will be one of the ones that has a, a good role there. I, I should mention that, we, um, that we've been working hard um, also on other space-based uh, telescopes that um, have a broad field of view, um, which, is, uh, or which is in some sense better optimized for the mid-range of those very, very distant supernova um, that we would like to work, at, work on from space. non-scientists, non-physicists like myself who would like to uh, educate my wife on this topic tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps I missed this, but can you uh, elaborate more on the kind of practical, tangible implications of this study, this work, in terms of what we do with it? So this is a, this was, you know, touching on the topics that I, 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 I mentioned uh, at the very end here, some of the story is, is this one where it's very hard to predict how, when you learn something fundamental about how the world works, how you'll end up using it. So nobody would have predicted, for example, that you know, when Einstein's theory of general relativity, you know, started talking about you know, clocks in, in, uh, you know, and relativistic motion, you know, they're moving too fast, that it would ever have a, such a practical application as the fact that we're all using GPS every day now, and uh, you couldn't do GPS unless you had that very fundamental understanding of how space and time work. And it's that way in which um, I think the, the biggest impact will be felt. Now, there's lots of other smaller impacts along the way. When you focus a lot of really smart people on these kinds of, of projects, they just invent things right and left. And so, for example, you know, we've already, for these projects, invented, uh, we took developments that were originally invented for actually the SSC um, uh, super collider you know, back when. Uh, we converted them to a purpose um, for another version of that CCD imager that I was uh, talking about earlier. And that new technology is now going to be used for medical um, imaging as well. So what, what, you know, there are these many side things that you wouldn't do if you were just trying to get somebody to work on a new medical imager. I don't think they would have thought of going that route. But there's something about having a very difficult challenge and putting smart people to work on it that ends up often uh, making them invent things that you can then use for lots of purposes. Um, we discussed earlier the challenge that we call... Uh, actually, do you want the, uh, the mic? Uh, we discussed briefly earlier the challenge of getting smart people into this field, whereas previously a lot of the people ended up on Wall Street who should have come to Berkeley to be your you know, <laughs> successor. How do we entice young smart people to go into science? I mean, in, in some sense, this, this, uh, this kind of topic 
um, I think is, is one of the best, uh, you know, the best advertisements for, 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 doing, uh, for coming into sciences. And I, I find that uh, I, I've watched you know, many students who begin pulled in to these very big, deep philosophical fundamental questions um, and then find themselves fascinated by all the things they learn how to do as scientists and, of course, go off into the world and, and work on lots lots of things you know, as, as our science workforce. Um, but there, there is something about these, these sort of deep fundamental questions, um, which is, I think, also just a great uh, you know, enticement in, into the field. And so I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm at the moment getting particularly interested in some of the questions of what will it take to bring more people uh, you know, you know, in, into the field. Also, what will it take to teach a little more about how we approach problems as scientists to people who are not going to go into the sciences. Because I think that that's actually um, also a very important part of our job as scientists. Um, I think that there's many uh, ways in which we ask questions of the world and we, and we do things that could be useful no matter what you apply it to, what science or any other area. If I understood you correctly, I heard you say that uh, we believe now that the universe rate of expansion was decreasing and now the rate is increasing. Is that right? So what, the what are the ideas yeah. on what's the the, what's causing that? That switch. Yeah. So what we believe, um, uh, you know, our current picture um, of, of how that worked would be that way you know, back in time over seven billion years ago, everything, remember it's always been expanding. It's just a question of whether it's been expanding faster or slower. So if you go back in time, everything was closer together. It was a much denser place. That means that everything felt each other's gravity much more strongly. And we think that back in time, um, the gravity was the dominant player, and it did slow the expansion. It's just that as things became more and more dilute and further and further apart, the gravity became relatively weaker compared, you know, the, the effect of the gravity was relatively weaker compared to this underlying um, hum of the dark energy that was just waiting to be felt. And then once the gravity became, you know, ineffective enough, then the dark energy um, was, you know, took over in, and it became the dominant player, and now the universe started speeding up again, its expansion. That, that's our current picture, but you should remember that you, know, you should take it with a big grain of salt since we don't know the answer. We don't know if really um, the dark energy is behaving the way we, that, you know, in this simple way. I, by the way, I don't know, I was told at one point that we have to watch time, so maybe I should take uh, just one or two questions? Thank one, okay. <laughs> is, is there a role for amateur astronomers to work on this field or smaller observatories to make contributions to this, or is it you just need the big science to carry on forward. It's I interestingly, this area is one of the few areas where uh, amateur um, astronomers actually played a role as t getting things going in the beginning. So when we were studying those, uh, when we first recognized that type 1a supernova, the one that we, you know, that's this triggered phenomenon that we uh, use as our standard candle, um, the people who were finding those supernova for the, for the professional astronomers to study were, were mostly amateurs. There was one great uh, example of a um, a Reverend Evans um, who lived uh, in Australia at that time and, uh, and would go out in his backyard every night and look at one after another galaxy, about 200, 300 galaxies that he had memorized what they looked like. And he was the most prolific supernova finder for, for a number of years uh, before we actually started to turn this into a more robotic you know, uh, uh, problem. Now today, um, I think that the, the, you know, the game has raised so high in terms of you know, the level of precision that we're after that these sorts of problems probably will not be addressed by the amateur astronomers, except to the extent that we're still occasionally using uh, amateurs in these crowdsourced um, ways where you send images, you put images up on the web and anybody all over the world can look, help look through the images to find the uh, supernova. And uh, that actually has been uh, quite successful. They get you know, thousands of man hours of, uh, of time out of people uh, just, just when they for the fun of it, when they, when they put it up. So occasionally that still happens. Well, well thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>